everyone to the sixth event in the Lean Into Allyship series. Uh, before we get started, I will cover uh, a few housekeeping things before we jump into the event. But I wanted to just stop and ask again, we did this in the last event. Um, for those that, that it's your first event, please enter that into the Q&A, just saying it's your first time or something just to let us know. And, and the reason I do that is uh, last time I was actually really surprised by the number of individuals whose first time it was. Over half of the group, it was their first time. And so we just like to get to know uh, who's in the audience. And again, enter that into the Q&A because we, uh, we have turned off the chat for this event um, just to prevent Zoom bombing because that has occurred in, in previous events like this. Um, and so we'll be interacting through the Q&A solely tonight. So again, we have quite a few um, first timers. It looks like probably about a quarter of the, the group here is um, attending this for the first time. So that's helpful for me to know. Um, and so you're going to hear us talk tonight about a lot of different organizations and knowing that about uh, a quarter of you are new to the series wanted to welcome you and just to let you know um, when you hear a few of these names what they refer to so you're going to hear me refer to the generator um, at, at kind of the start and the end of the event and they are a um, startup accelerator that operates here in madison milwaukee and minneapolis they've actually graciously provided the technology and the back-end support throughout the event to make this a nationwide discussion to make sure that the technology wasn't uh, a constraint to how far we could extend these conversations nehemiah center for urban leadership development is actually a nonprofit that dr g founded so we'll be hearing from him um, to start the event and we'll, we'll talk about that vision here in a minute Justified Anger is an initiative that ne the Nehemiah organization started. And so you can learn more about Nehemiah and Justified Anger at nehemiah.org. And then you're going to learn about a new, for those who have attended the series before, we're actually going to talk about Foster tonight as well. And that is a new uh, organization, uh, to, like I said, to the series. And we have Jackie Hunt, who will be talking about that since she is the founder, visionary, and CEO for that organization as well. So the one thing I just wanted to share is that we are going to encourage you to donate to Nehemiah and Foster tonight um, because we can't expect them to support these events, bring their staff here and educate us for free. And I would, because knowing this is getting towards the end of the year, would ask to see if, uh, have you looking to see if your company does a donation match? Just again, to maximize the impact of where your dollar can go. Uh, before I talk about the agenda, just one quick thing. This question comes up in every event. This event is being uh, recorded. So you will get the recording at the end. You will get a, a link to the first five uh, episodes or events as well. And that's on Justified Anger's YouTube page. And everything that we send via the chat and all of the resources will be sent in the summary email as well. So I would say, don't worry about you know, writing all of that down. Just kind of take in the message that we're, we're talking through tonight. Um, and with that, we're gonna jump right into the agenda. It's packed. We're gonna do our best to keep this to an hour. I will say that uh, we may run 10 or 15 minutes over because it, there's a lot that we're gonna cover, um, but we're gonna start by having Dr. G provide his post-election response. And then we're gonna go into having Tyler Nyland and, and Dr. Stephanie Budge talk about how do you have productive conversations um, about the racial uh, disparities that exist in our country. And then we'll turn it over to Jackie Hunt to talk about Foster, uh, talk about really an overview of the organization and those who are overlooked in the holiday season before we wrap up with a few educational opportunities. And so with that, we're gonna dive right in. Um, for those that, again, who are new, um, Dr. G, welcome. You are the president, founder, and visionary for the nonprofit Nehemiah. And the vision for this organization is engaging the greater Madison community to empower African-American individuals, families, and communities to bring about hope, transformation, and justice. And you ha he has 35 years of experience in this space, so he has a lot of knowledge to share. Um, and one of the big things that he is focused on is educating, coaching, and mobilizing white allies, which is all about what this uh, series is for. So with that, Dr. G, I wanted to ask you more of an open, broad question and let you take this wherever you want to. Um, but obviously, we just came off of a very polarizing election season. And I think people are quick to think that with Biden and Kamala Harris winning the election, that everything is going to be immediately better. And I've heard a lot of conversation, a lot of celebration, and wanted to ask you a series of questions. And again, take this where you want to. Um, sure. But what, what are your reactions to the election process and the outcome? 
you know, what are your expectations moving forward? And, and how do you respond to people when they say, don't you think things are so much better now? Sure. I mean, there's so much um, that I that I can and want to say on this, but I, I know it's a full agenda, um, Dan. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to be uh, concise. I just want to say I really appreciate you and your leadership and continuing to help to pull forums like this together. Um, we talk about the we talk about the election being polarizing. I don't know if that's accurate. America has been polarizing. It's been polarized for centuries. And I think what we've seen with many of the things from the pandemic to the killings of African Americans, unarmed African Americans, and the election is really revealing to us what has been problematic in the United States. My concern is we will look at an administrator, whoever's occupying the Oval Office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and we'll say, that's the problem. He's the problem. The problem with that is that when that individual is gone or, or, or has been um, unseated in an election, we tend to just breathe easy and think, okay, now we're back to normal. Normal is what's problematic. We've seen the, 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 um, the exposure of the normal. And so what I would say, Dan, is that the election just shows how problematic things are, that we are certainly in need of tremendous healing, but we keep thinking the election was divisive. Um, um, the election of 2016 was divisive. President Trump was divisive. That's not a new phenomenon. And to pin that on one administration, to pin that on one individual um, is to um, remove us from, from the responsibility that we should all share in being a part of, of the solution. And so on one hand, as sad as these past months have been, there's a part of me that says, maybe now people will see what we've been talking about. Um, you know, I, I've got a daughter who's in grad school now, but I remember her watching Monsters, Inc. And just this whole concept that the monster that you think underneath your bed really is underneath your bed and they're running a factory someplace. Um, it's almost as if, I told you, I told you, I told you. So I think for a lot of people of color, we have felt, we've been telling people, we've been telling people. So the emotion is, is sort of the, the overlay of saying, now people will see it, but with bated breath, we're thinking, but will we go back to normal? And so um, I think what's stressful and more problematic for me than the election was that we have not noticed what the election has revealed and we're not sure what to do next. And we need to do things like we're doing tonight to lean into each other, to work towards solutions. But um, very problematic in, in, a, in a real general sense, Dan. And I'm just looking to see um, if there's any questions from the audience with any of that as well. Um, so one of the things uh, for the attendees is as we're talking through various aspects of this as well, please enter your questions into the Q&A. We'll make sure that we uh, call them out as much as we can, the specific people who we think are best suited to answer the question. Um, Dan, but I don't. I out? I'm sorry, I kept something out while you're looking for the question. Yeah, absolutely. Just one thing I want to say is what is it? 70 million people uh, voted who feel that America's on the right track, irrespective of what's happened to marginalized people and people of color. That's that piece is problematic. But I want to I want to use a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And one of the things that many black people would say is we weren't always shocked at what certain, what, what comments came out of certain people's mouths. But what's hurtful um, is the silence of our friends. And so one of the things I wanna say as we go into this time is that it's really time for us to step up in this work because it's really not over. And if we think that, um, that's part of the reason why we don't make great progress because we think the president's gonna fix this, the vice president's gonna fix this, the black secretary of defense is gonna fix this. They can't do that, they don't have that power. We have the power. And so if we really think that this is an opportunity for a new day, we must help that new day dawn. But we cannot look to Washington or to um, Chamber of Commerce or uh, the cap state capital to fix that. Who do we know? What are we doing? Are we educating and donating and, and, and affiliating? We have to take a deep look at ourselves and ask, are we a part of the solution or part of the problem? But this is time for real good hearted, um, fair minded individuals to step out of their silence and out of their comfort and to be a real part of the solution. 
Well, and I think, Dr. G, that's a perfect segue into uh, what we wanted really the meat of this uh, meeting to, or event to talk through. Um, when you say that silence um, of our friends is, is what's really the most impactful, you know, as an ally, it's critical that the attendees that are, are listening in is that you speak up. And I know oftentimes it's hard to know what to say, especially when you're early on in your journey. Um, and obviously, as we think, think, you know, look forward to the holidays, it's going to be different, right? It's going to be more virtual, um, but it's still important to be prepared to talk about these things, especially when they come up, whether proactively or reactively. Um, and so we have some prepared questions for Tyler and Dr. Stephanie uh, Budge, and we're going to we're going to talk through those. But I also want to encourage those in the audience to start, you know, asking the questions as, as you're listening to their responses. We want you to really start driving the conversation. Um, so we'll be monitoring that and make sure we have some time for that as well. But before we, we actually get into some of those questions, we're actually going to uh, release a quick poll. And basically what we want to know is on a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you in engaging in dialogue today about race with your family and friends? One meaning, you know, you won't enter the conversation and five is you feel like you're an expert and can lead the conversation. Just wanting to see kind of uh, get a feel for again, the audience and where you're at in, in that journey. Someone responded with a six, so they're very confident. Um, it looks like uh, as we're looking at the results here, the average seems to be at about a 2.5 or a three, um, which is good to know. We have, we have some fours in there as well. And that's just a good baseline for us to, to see that. And so we're going to now jump in. And so Stephanie and Tyler, could you just briefly uh, introduce yourself um, and just share your name and maybe some uh, brief background on yourselves that you feel like the audience should know before we, we jump in? Actually, it looks like, sorry, the results just popped up. Four is actually the more, most common. So we're going to look at that again at the end of this event and just see how that shifted and, and get some more context from you as well. Um, so, so again, Tyler and Stephanie, could you just share your, um, just a brief background about yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Tyler Nyland, and I am what we call the Faith Community Relationship Manager at Nehemiah. So I work for Dr. G's organization. I've been in Madison and lived here for about three and a half years after I got my master's in Chicago. Um, and I'll just say for me, uh, the only way that I see myself as someone to really speak on this or as someone who's sort of a panelist here is I have failed a lot at this. Um, I have had not good conversations um, and I've failed in a lot of ways. And so I, I just hope that anything, you know, any, anything I share is just coming out of that place of, of, of failure and, and, and growing and continuing to, uh, to engage in the conversation. Hey everyone, um, I'm Stephanie Budge. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I am an associate professor in counseling psychology here at UW-Madison. And I'm also um, the director of the Advancing Health Equity and Diversity Program um, at UW-Madison as well. Um, and um, I'm in the same place that Tyler is. Um, I'm in no way an expert on this. I'm coming from more of my uh, experience of trying really hard and then also kind of seeing how that goes <laughs> along the way. Um, but I also teach therapists how to have these conversations with their clients. Um, and so um, that's part of my job and part of the work that we do. Um, so that'll be some of what I talk about today. All right. So I think this, this first question is going to go out to you, Tyler. Um, when we think about some of the common statements or questions that, that we hear, right? You know, I don't even see color. Uh, why do we have to keep talking about race? You know, why is everything about race in 2020? Um, another thing I've heard is systemic racism isn't real. Black people just need to work harder like I have and stop making excuses. Or in, in particular to the Black Lives Movement, um, all lives matter. When you start to hear those things, how do you approach responding to those, those types of comments? Yeah, sure. Um... You know, unfortunately, those are comments that, you know, you do hear somewhat often. And, and I, I think in light of hearing some of those things, I want to sort of maybe challenge the framework of the question a little bit about answering those specific questions. Um, because, I, you know, a lot of us view the holidays or perhaps conversations. I know this is an, how to have an anti-race holiday, uh, all of that, you know, 
viewing these sort of conversations and opportunities with family and friends that um, might not go overwhelmingly well. You know, a lot of those questions seem like they're asked with without a lot of curiosity in them. Oftentimes when we find ourselves in those situations, they're not necessarily questions that are maybe genuine as much as trying to sort of get a rise out of you. Uh, I know sometimes that's been the case for me where people have, have, have asked those questions, but without a sense of curiosity or genuine engagement, it's more of just out of, out of trying to see where you respond. And so, um, you know, I think a lot, a lot of times we, we see on social media, we see all over the place, this idea of like, oh, well, I'm going back um, to interact with my, my family or my friends, and it's going to be an interesting time. I don't really know how to handle it. And we almost view it as those conversations and those moments uh, are like our one time moment to shine as an ally. Uh, it's, it's like, okay, everything is built up into this one moment that we have to, we have to get right. And we have to, we have to beat or, 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 or have the right argument to, to really convince someone. And that's what it takes to be an ally. And, and my question in, in sort of reference to that is why is this the moment of high stakes? I mean, uh, oh, you know, once in a, once in a year or so family holiday times, why are we sing out, you know, these one-time moments as what it means to be an ally and to really come back and confront rather than seeing up uh, the rest of the year. And not just year, but we know as, as we enter this, when we count the cost of what this looks like, that we know that this is years and years and years and years and years of commitment that we have when we enter into this, this place, this field. And um, yeah, so, so why, why are we focusing maybe more on the one moment rather than seeing the rest of the year? And so I'm not necessarily sure if engaging with all of these questions in a point by point debate is actually the best posture for the moment uh, of a family holiday or, or gathering. And, and I want to make it clear that this isn't out of, I th this wouldn't be out of cowardice, uh, choosing to not engage with these questions out of cowardice. Uh, I think sometimes it can be more out of effectiveness because we have to ask the question of ourselves, are we here to win an argument? Are we here to truly advance the cause by by loving and, and, and caring for those who, who are around us? Um, and I think one of the questions that I've wrestled with uh, as I've wrestled with this is the question, isn't this just being the white moderate who MLK condemns in his letter from Birmingham jail? Because he has a scathing condemnation of white, in that case, pastors, but white individuals who who play the moderate, who play the the waiting game and all of that. And, and I think it could be seen as that if you don't do anything with the rest of the life that you've been given, if the whole 364 days outside of the year, you're, you're, you're kind of not really doing anything and you're holding on to this one moment as your place. But one conversation with family and friends usually isn't enough. It wasn't enough for me to, for me to become to understand these realities. I had to have moments and conversations and continued places. And so I think it's a lifetime of faithfulness where the people around you see that, that they can kind of recognize and see that you're drawn by something outside of yourself, that, that these conversations, these topics, that Black Lives Matter, that all of this is not just about you and yourself, but you're drawn in by love for your fellow human, which compels you to act and stand in solidarity. And so it's, it's a lifetime of faithful steps for each of us in the right direction, not one argument that alienates and, and shames people, and can often be more about me being self-righteous or me being right or having to be right or proving to myself. Oftentimes I've found that when I um, sort of uh, armor up and try and go after individuals, I've, I'm, I'm actually just trying to prove to myself I'm an ally or I'm trying to prove myself that I care about the cause. And so I feel like I have to do this and instead of actually uh, leaning in and figuring out what's the true liberation um, uh, for, for myself, even in this. And uh, because chances are just like me, I, I wasn't that long ago, someone who may have said some of these things, who had these questions, who, who worked through these things, who had these perspectives based on the experiences and narratives of history that I was told. And so to, to come across with that more self-righteous might just not be the best posture. And, and that lifetime of faithfulness, you know, outside of yourself can cause and draw, I think the curiosity of others um, to engage I find most often when I'm in this situation, uh, people lean in and they, after they've seen a long history and a long steps of faithfulness and they lean in and they say, oh, why do you care so much about this? 
what, what's captivated your heart? Can you tell me some of these answers to these questions that I don't necessarily get? And, and that's the way of openness and creating those genuine conversations. And I think that's where the real conversation maybe can start. And what I love what you said, Tyler, and even in the planning meeting for this, uh, and I want to just reiterate, when you talked about, are you engaging to win the argument or advance the cause? I mean, that really stood out to me. And what I started to reflect on was oftentimes, uh, I realized I was actually trying to win an argument. And so I loved what you said there about the posture and how you actually approach the conversation. And, and this uh, really dovetails nicely into a question for you, Stephanie, with that in mind, when you when you want to approach a conversation with really trying to be as productive as possible and like what Tyler said, not just this one time to win an argument, um, can you share some helpful tips on how to actually interact and engage in these conversations that can typically be pretty emotionally charged? Yes, thank you. Um, I am putting into the chat um, a link to a PDF that I think is super helpful. Um, it's from seedtheway.com and it's a handout that talks about the difference between calling in and calling out. And we hear this language kind of a lot on social media and maybe um, in other types of media. Um, and I think it's helpful to have this as a, as a reference when you're trying to think about what's the goal or what is it that I actually want to get out of um, conversations to be able to have of, um, productive and loving conversations um, with my family and friends. Um, and I, I think it's really helpful to see this resource because you can kind of try to decide what's happening in the moment and um, what do I think is going to be helpful. So for example, um, if you uh, would like to call someone out for saying something racist um, when you're in kind of Zoom gatherings or whatever it is that you're doing um, over this holiday season, um, you know, it's it's okay to let somebody know that what they've said is unacceptable and that um, that's in the um, effort to try to prevent further harm. Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can do this. And so there are things like you can say, well, it sounds like you just said blank. Is that what you really meant? And then you can really start to have some conversations. So you can say, I wonder if you've really considered the impact of your words, um, or I need to push back against that. I disagree. I don't see it that way. So there are a couple of different ways that you can, um, can achieve that. The goal of calling somebody out is to stop something harmful from happening in the moment. Um, but there's also an additional piece that you may wanna go through when you're talking to people who you want to have deep relationships with and continue to have deep relationships with. Um, and often in those situations, people choose to do something that we say is calling in. Um, and so that's when you want to have um, deeper conversation where you can make meaning together and you can find a mutual sense of understanding. Um, so in those situations, you can say something like, hmm, I'm really curious about what you just said there. What was your intention when you said that? Or why do you think that's the case? Why do you believe that to be true? And I think you can really start to have some conversations about where some of these pieces are coming from um, that will hopefully kind of start to de-escalate a conversation before um, some of the emotions start to rise that Tyler was just talking about. But what I will say is that um, usually when you start to have these conversations, whether you're calling in or out, people almost always respond with defensiveness. And so this is um, probably the biggest thing that um, we teach people in the mental health field around like how to kind of regulate the emotions that are happening and how you recognize that in yourself and what you do there. Um, and so there are a few things and a few tips that I thought might be helpful um, to start. So the first piece, and I know it sounds simple, but this is actually the first thing that goes is your breathing. So um, start to feel defensive or you start to feel like you're really activated um, that the first thing that you should do is take some deep breaths. So um, you can choose to ask for a break in the conversation to have another time or even another day. Tyler was just talking about like, this doesn't not everything has to happen exactly perfectly in the moment. And these conversations actually never look perfect. They're always messy um, and it doesn't quite come out exactly the way that you want it to. Um, so usually I would just say, just take a break, take a breather, um, and then maybe you can decide in that moment what you wanna do. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, you should remember that when you start to have an angry and defensive reaction and other people do at the same time, both of your limbic systems are telling your bodies that you're in danger and that you need to prepare for fight or flight. And I know that that sounds kind of silly because you're having a conversation, but that's actually literally what's happening in your body. Um, and when we feel shame, that um, kind of activates the same part in our brain that 
is um, makes us feel pain. And so it's really important to kind of think about if that's what's happening in the moment, these are real reactions that you're having. Um, and there are a couple of things that you can do to help stop that reaction from happening. So part of that is taking that pause, taking a breath and actually doing something to say like, I'm safe, I'm totally fine right now. Um, you know, and kind of having some of those moments to tell yourself that you're okay. So that that way you can start to calm your body and your brain a little bit. Um, and the last piece of advice that I have when things start to get um, amplified and people start to get activated and you start to get activated is to have some flexibility. Um, so, you know, part of this is like when we start to have these conversations, Tyler was talking about, you know, doing this to win. So part of this is thinking about like, there are multiple outcomes that can happen from these conversations. And so kind of considering some flexibility around what the outcome might be from this. And that can actually help you to kind of deactivate a little bit too, because it might not be exactly what you want the outcome to be, but it could be a sliver of change um, that happens or some like little moments of insight that people may have um, that will help you kind of to start to understand each other a little bit better. Um, I'll stop there because I know that, that I just said a lot. Um, I have a lot more to say, but I'll pause until we have more uh, questions. That's thank you, Stephanie. Um, and and I will say uh, we are getting a, a few questions in, and we'll um, we'll be actually answering those here shortly. And I'll actually have Samantha come on and, and read some of the questions. But one of the things that um, you know sometimes happens in conversations is you think you you both parties agree, you think you're on the same page, and then all of a sudden you're thrown for a loop with a a yes and or even a yes but such, such as yes but what about the violence and the the rioting or the looting or yeah but but there you know, think about the drug use and, and they're really, you know, if you do the crime, you do the time and, or, you know, it takes a, a turn from where you thought you were going. How do you handle those conversations and how do you bring that back to a productive uh, space? Uh, and I'm just curious to get uh, one or both of your perspectives on that. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say that I think that um, when people start to bring in what I think um, people consider to be facts. Um, I would say at that moment, I would try to find out from somebody of like, oh, I actually have a lot of information about that. Um, or I know some, I know that there's a lot of information about that. And I would love to kind of provide you with some more information. Um, so you can kind of provide that as a, as a context of being like, would you like to be able to have a conversation around this information? Um, but I think what may happen is somebody will say, no, I don't, like that won't change my mind. Um, and if that's the case, you're gonna have a different conversation um, because normally what happens is that if somebody starts saying something like that, you start to give them information. And if that information isn't what somebody is seeking, then you need to go to an emotional place um, because then you're gonna really try to get somebody to experience um, empathy, um, which will go a little bit further than if um, they're not willing or ready to hear um, facts about things. So that's one piece of advice that I have. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is, you know, determining the posture of the other individual, right? What's the, is, is, this, is this a question of curiosity? Is this statements of curiosity? Or is it just statements of like, yeah, I wanted to listen to you for a little bit, but I don't really care what you have to say. I'm just going to say what I think. Um, that's always the, you know, the interesting thing to discern is, is where is the other person? Because if you can, I mean, if you sense that there's openness, sometimes that is a place, you know, like I said earlier, oftentimes, you know, for me, it, it might have to do with, hey, is this the time to engage or not? But when you've got that, that's, that's the time to engage. That's the time to lean in and be like, let's talk about this. Let's dialogue. Or maybe even asking the questions, well, what's your, where are your sources of that? Like what, what, what from your experience tells you that that's true? And even just beginning to question that, just to say, how, how do you know that's true? Or what, what sources are telling you that I think is a huge way. And then, and then if they don't know, and they're actually genuine, you can give sources. And, and like Stephanie said, I think, I think that's wonderful is the, the asking, uh, would you, would you like to engage with this? Um, because then you can do follow-up. You can, you can really say, Hey, I'll read this article with you. Let's, let's talk in a week about what we thought about it. And, and I think that can be a good way to move forward when you actually have that openness to it. Awesome. Well, thank you both for, for weighing in on that. And uh, Samantha, just a quick check on the Q&A. Are there some questions coming in that um, you want to uh, ask Tyler and Stephanie as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Dan. So we've had some really great questions and comments. Um, one theme that has come through um, on both comment and question would just be lending to that very real concept that we can struggle with our own variation of confidence or almost self-censorship, depending on our audience, right? And the confidence um, and comfort that we have in those settings. So one of our attendees had said, the family I have the hardest time speaking up to is in-laws. I don't want to be the one to rock the boat when it's not really my boat. And they are looking for some thoughts and input on that. You know, I, I think some of this may depend on, um, you know, family dynamics. Um, so this is always an it depends kind of uh, an answer. But I would say, you know, I think that often what my wife and I do is we um, will say, you know, if it's our family, then we talk about it ahead of time. And we say, like, how are we going to do this together? Or like, you know, your family sometimes says these things and it really upsets me. Like, would you be, can you do this? Or like, do we have a code word for like when things start to get um, to a point where they're is something that I'd like to say, but I'm not quite there with your family yet. So I think part of it is um, in this situation, in, it's in-laws specifically. So I think engaging with the person who maybe has a, lo a longer standing relationship and a different power dynamic, um, that I think that that's one possible avenue that you could take. Um, I have a couple more thoughts, but I don't know, Tyler, if you, would, if you wanna go first. I mean, I just think that it's pretty much like if you have situations like that where you're, you're kind of uncertain all that, sometimes good things are even just sharing about your genuine life. I mean, usually a, a question, questions that come up, what's been on your heart, what's been on your mind. And you can share a little bit about this is, this is what I, I oh, I was at this place volunteering or I was serving. Or I, I, I just did this uh, course with um, uh, a group called Nehemiah. Can I tell you about it? You know, stuff like that um, where you're able to actually engage in different ways and throughout the course, like if people, again, I, I think taking the emphasis off the one time moment, but if they know you and they know this is on your heart, um, it's a place where uh, I, sometimes they'll even avoid talking to you about it because they already know where you stand. And I think even them avoiding that is a, is a mark in their own head that there's something there uh, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, and then another one that we uh, could talk about came from AJ and she, they say, um, I come from an extended family of very hard workers. So often they're focused on that aspect, i.e. I've worked hard for what I have. There are lots of people out, aren't th out there who aren't trying to work. So why should I put in resources when they're not trying as hard as I have? Do you have any tips for how to continue that conversation in a productive way? Yeah, you know, I think that um, in this instance, I think making sure that you're validating the person's experience of the work while also not validating the bias behind it. So, you know, there are a couple of ways that I think you can can do that, which is, um, you know, like sharing with them, like, yes, I've like seen how hard that you've worked and I can um, definitely, you know, tell me about that. <laughs> um, and like really wanting to engage in that component of it. And then I think also saying like, I wonder if you would be open to listening to some of these podcasts um, that talk about the history of where some of these messages come from and why things are the way they are, you know? And I think um, part of that is like, you know, again, I think you're, you're hearing hopefully from me and Tyler that it's like, trying to engage people in that curiosity and that, and that component of like, let's do some of this together. Or like, would you be open? Like, I want to listen to your story. And also I want you to hear about the historical aspects that have led to, you know, these inequities. Um, so I, I think that there are ways of, of, of balancing the conversation again, to like decrease um, some of the, the defensiveness. So it doesn't feel like people are just feeling attacked because then often people don't want to engage or listen. Um, so that's one piece of advice that I have for that. Thanks. And I think the personal attack piece too, like doing that, um, one, th it, it can be really hard. One of the things that Pastor G has actually shared with me um, is, so one of the things that I do, I'm also on his staff as a, a pastor at um, Fountain of Life, which is uh, a predominantly black space, predominantly black church. And one of the things I remember um, him telling me really early on um, was he said this, uh, he said, when you go into conversations and with your, with your family, and, and when you step into places like that, don't you dare think that you can just sit there and, and not engage in any way with your family and act like you're cool to come worship with us on Sunday and sit with us. But don't you dare 
think that you can go in and disrespect individuals who have worked hard for you, who've loved you, who've cared for you, who've raised you, who've invested so much in you. Don't you dare think you can go in and disrespect them completely as if you're some 20 year old person who knows better. You really have to continue to lean in because that, that's the hard choice of, of being able to really understand it. It, it's, it can be painful and painful to choose that. But sometimes that's the effective place where instead of being disrespectful completely and just throwing people to the side, looking in and choosing to lean in and to, to, to love people into this. Yeah, that definitely ties back to what you said earlier, right, about leading with love and sharing what's on your heart and coming from that authentic place. Um, this ties in, I think, with that as well. And if either of you want to take um, the lead on this one, because I'm assuming that you both are going to answer with um, a yes. Um, but Rachel had asked, do either of you integrate mindfulness into your anti-racist work? Taylor, you want to take it back and then Stephanie can wrap it up maybe? Sure. Uh, for me, for me, mindfulness in different ways, meditative practices, like um, as as a Christian prayer for me, and and that's really some of the keys into how I actually engage with this, letting myself escape the moment in in that space, and and to to have those moments uh, outside of that. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. I, um, w- when I teach this work, um, I do what we call grounding exercises, um, before we talk about any of this at all, because I ask people to go into a place where they imagine experiencing shame and like, ha- you know, really getting a lot of insight and awareness for themselves for how they experience shame. Um, so that they, they can kind of move through working through their own mistakes, but then it's also, um, knowing what other people are going to also feel when they're going through it so that they can help other people through that. So we do a lot of mindfulness and um, grounding exercises around deep breathing, paying attention to where the stress is in your body and where the tension is. um, And that can really help you understand your own shame reactions and maybe even help you to have those conversations with your family members if and when they they have those reactions when you're having these conversations um, with. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you both. I think that catches us up on our open questions for now. Yeah. And I think we just want to wrap it up with one final um, concept that actually hasn't come into this series. Um, But some of you may have heard of the term white savior. And that's, you know, the idea that you have all of the answers, the solutions you need to save the community that you're trying to be an ally to. Um, And there's multiple definitions, but that's uh, kind of the definition that I have used when I've, when I've heard that term. Um, and I just want to wonder, you, both of you could answer this, but why is that mindset extremely dangerous when you're trying to always have the answers and prove that you're right and the other person uh, is just um, either ignorant or incorrect? Yeah, uh, it's it's a difficult concept in general because in honest, it, it, white, white saviorism really just plays into the idea of whiteness in particular. And I think in a lot of ways, white patriarchy. Um, I was actually reading a a book today and there's a small quote that I I can read on this. It said, um, the idea of being a a white master in some of these ways that sometimes comes through in a lot of our white savior type of ways we bring things about is is not as a person, um, but as a personality, a masculinist uh, personality that usurps responsibility for the well-being and protection of an institution and, and, and acting who must control the space and order small worlds and and make everything fit into our cultural frameworks and, and, and have answers and have everything together. Because if we pull uh, any threads out from underneath the system that we've created that benefits us, we just pop. And so we have to be the one that controls because if we let, if we lose control, uh, we don't really know where it's going. We've never really had to do that before. And so that's why it's so easy and um, we conti- I have to continue to deal with that all the time of just having to wrestle with how am I, how am I trying to take control here? How am I still trying to cling to power and choosing to engage with that and say, that's not the way um, I'm forward in this case. Yeah. And I would say um, this is, again, I think some of the deep work that we need to do um, for the folks who are here who are white, um, who are listening to this, especially, I think it's that 
deep work around what's my intention behind the work that I'm doing. Um, so beyond even some of that awareness around what your emotional reactions are to having these conversations, a lot of the time um, you think that what your intentions are are good um, because that's what you've been taught. Um, and so part of this work is really trying to um, figure out where some of those messages came from. How often have you actually talked to a black indigenous or person of color around what they want or um, you know what the community wants and how many times are you in spaces where you're asking these questions and, and listening as a person um, rather than kind of say, thinking that you know what people need or what, or what they may want. Um, and so I, I would say um, part of this is more around trying to have an awareness of how many times you've actually had those kinds of conversations or how much of that um, internal work that you've done. Um, and it's, and the thing is, is that it's, it's a uh, lifelong work and I'm just slogging through it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that that's part of, um, I would um, recommend reading about um, the concept of cultural humility um, as, as part of that work. Um, and if anybody's interested in some of those um, resources, I'm happy to put more in the chat. At, but um, just for the sake of time, um, I'll, I'll kind of stop there and see if there's anything else to share around that. Perfect. We actually don't have any other questions. So I would say, um, Stephanie, if you have any of those links, that would be you know quick and easy to type into the chat. That way we can send it out to everybody uh, afterwards as well. That would be great. Um, so thank you, Stephanie and Tyler, for, for talking us through that section. That was really helpful. And now we wanted to, to transition over to give an overview of Foster and you really hone in on what that organi organization is focused on and thinking about the families that are often overlooked in this time of, of giving uh, at the holidays. And so I wanted to introduce and bring out Jackie Hunt. So she's the founder, CEO, and, and visionary for, the, for this nonprofit, um, whose vision is to ensure stability or ability for strong, successful, and thriving Black families who are raising healthy and success, successful children, supporting their families, and who engage in their communities in meaningful ways. And so she's actually been doing this work in our community for 23 years, um, which is incredible. Um, and she was an inspiration uh, to me when I was able to meet her and, and really start the planning for this event. So um, Jackie, to start off, could you just provide an overview of what Foster is doing, um, how you started it with being a gap filler as we were talking, and really what you're focused on with this organization at large? Sorry, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, so how Foster got started was, I'll be honest, it was um, the, um, I did a, a, a needs assessment for uh, my class back in 1999 as a student at Madison College, it was MATC then. And my whole um, goal was to kind of eradicate the foster care system as it exists, right? Um, because I was seeing a disproportionate number of um, black and brown kids being placed in homes. And um, as a, my early years as a human service professional, some of the family and the individuals that I work with were trying to get their kids back out of the system. And so I was walking alongside of them, helping them um, meet the conditions of return. So fast forward to about 20, hmm, 12 years before now. So that's about what, 20, 2014, 15, 16, somewhere in there. I'm a therapist um, at Journey Mental Health. I mean, it was the Mental Health Center of Dane County. But my first real job was through Nehemiah. Um, I started in 1996 as a community support specialist. And part of our roles were to uh, support families with the transition of the program from well, from for W2, from Welfare to Work with Tommy Thompson as our governor. And so um, I was early um, in my own, own life transitions. And so it was basically the work was what I was doing myself, trying to rebuild my life and um, become self-sufficient. So anyway, um, I'm working now at Journey at Mental Health Center. And as a therapist or as a counselor, there was just things that I couldn't do. I, I, like my families were coming in they were depressed. They were using substances to, to self-medicate. Um, they were, um, you know, like just really going through crises after crisis after crisis and needing resources. And as a counselor, as the therapist, 
Um, I was told that, you know, I could refer them to services and things like that, but I needed to stay in my role. And it was really hard because first of all, it was hard enough to get people who looked like me to even come to the mental health center of Dane County. And, um, <laughs> and I was being successful at getting them to come in but they were coming in because they, I had become this lady in the community who helped people. And so they would come there seeking help. And it, 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 the, the emotional and the mental part of their needs wasn't the primary reason for them coming in. They were coming in because they needed support, like I said, with their kids being in the foster care system or because they were about to get evicted or because their lights were shut off or because they were homeless and things like that. So, of course, I couldn't do that work as a therapist at Journey. So I created what was called Gap Filler Ministries and um, at my church, Found of Life. And because my church, Found of Life, is the, I guess, partner with the organization Nehemiah, I never really stopped working for Nehemiah. I just stopped collecting the paycheck. And that was how I was able to support my families because you can't tell me what I can do in my church. So I'd invite them, come to my church, come to my church, you know, and I just kept creating things at church that would fill the gaps in the needed services that my families were facing in the community. Um, I remember one Sunday, boldly, my pastor called me out. <laughs> he was like, that that um, program, Jacqueline Hunt, you got Foster sitting on my shelf in the office right now. You know, they doing that. You know, like, you need to be doing this right now. And I was just like, dang. And he actually still had it. <laughs> like, I was like, wow. So anyway, um, I began to do more and more in the community. Um, creating these events at critical times where there was the risk of increased depression, increased substance use, um, inc increased stressors on the family overall. So, um, but someone had did those things for me. Um, that someone was Malele Chikasa Anana, the late Malele Chikasa Anana. She passed on this year, but as a mom, as a mom raising, I think at the time I had five kids, um, she would take me and other single moms after church on Mother's Day to brunch because she knew our kids were too little and wouldn't be able to take us out to a nice dinner and all that stuff. And she didn't want us to have to go home and cook. So um, about 12 years ago, Miss Malele um, was diagnosed with cancer and she stopped doing the things that she had been doing for us. Second thing Miss Malele did was at Christmas time on Christmas Eve, she would get all of us to drop our kids off at her house and she would take them to breakfast and let us moms go do whatever, finish up what things we needed to do on Christmas Eve. And then she'd take the kids to the Dollar Tree and let them pick out gifts to share with their siblings and with the family. Um, she did that for us all those years. And um, when she got sick, she stopped. Um, then we created the Dinner with Soul Santa. And um, the Dinner with Soul Santa was a way to um, have fun, have families have a fun evening with their kids without the stress of having to go home, cook and all that other stuff. And it was personal because I had an um, experience in my home where my grandbaby, um, like it was up all night. There was this one gift that she had, I, she wanted it so bad. And I didn't have the resources really to do it, but I knew it would make her Christmas everything. And so I got it. It was like a $300 horse called Spirit. It was one of my for real horses. And oh my God, me and my daughter sat up all night. We putting this horse together. It's about four o'clock and it's a snowstorm. And we ain't got the batteries. So I get in my car, I go to find his doggone batteries. I find them. I live almost in Verona. I found the batteries, a store, the gas station off of Fish Hatchery. And again, it's a snowstorm. I get there, get the batteries, they $10. I'm like, oh. so I give up the $10, I get the batteries. And anyway, we get Butterscotch. His name was Butterscotch, not Spirit. 
We get butterscotch and my grandbaby says, oh, thank you, thank you, Santa Claus. This is the best Christmas ever. And I wanted to go ballistic because of everything I had done to get that dog on horse. And some big fat white man with a beard was getting credit. <laughs> that was like, that's never gonna happen again. Little black kids need to see a black Santa. <laughs> so black Santa is my six foot six son and he wraps and wears shades. So that's the second event. Um, then back to school time where there was critical needs because I had five kids sending them back to school and the school supply list was crazy. I couldn't afford to do it. And I knew other parents couldn't afford to do it. So I just started filling the gaps in by creating these programs and these needs. We did the Christmas baskets and Thanksgiving baskets through my church as well. So how did Foster become Foster? Foster became Foster um, because um, I wanted to continue to do these things in the community and I had to separate it from my job. Simple as that. So now we are nonprofit, which was never my goal. And I still work for Nehemiah. I, like, as far as I'm concerned, Nehemiah is like my parent agency. <laughs> and so right now we're in the midst of our, um, so since the pandemic started in March, um, Foster, Nehemiah, Found a Life have been providing critical resources in this community from the, the day, from, ju from jump. We started getting lunches into the homes of children um, and families who were um, shut in from the pandemic. Kids no longer getting those three, two meals at school, breakfast and lunch. Um, we were doing that. We started a pantry where we were giving out boxes of food. Then we started with the essentials because Foster always did these random acts of kindness in February that gave away essential packages. So the church, people were wanting to give, people were trying to figure out how they could help. So it just kind of like over the course of, from I guess March to now, I can't tell you how many tons of food we've distributed. I can't tell you how many dollars we've assisted. We, we helped families with rent, um, internet, cable TV, um, just to keep the kids occupied. Um, to keep the internet in the home so they could go to school. Um, we give them, we've, we've provided like the essentials in the household for cleaning products, um, toiletries, toilet paper, you know, things like that. And so it's just been amazing how God has shown up and blessed us to be able to keep doing this. So uh, at Thanksgiving, we gave away over a hundred food baskets, a hundred essential kits and gift cards so that families could really have the kind of Thanksgiving that they were accustomed to, even in the pandemic. And we're on target to do the same for Christmas. And we're doing a virtual dinner with Soul Santa, which is going to be off the charts. <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna have you talk about that in just a, a minute, Jackie, about specifically uh, what's coming up and and the ask of the audience. But um, as we were preparing, one of the things that I I was um, kind of an aha for me is I feel like we talk about uh, marginalized groups as kind of a monolith, right? So we talk about people being marginalized and it's kind of this nebulous discussion. But when we were talking before the event, you shared the various levels of marginalized families that you deal with on a daily basis. And I wanted you to humanize that content for the audience because it was really impactful on me. So could you just share really briefly like the levels that you see mm -hmm. and the challenges um, you touched on it a little bit, but some of okay. the challenges of those families um, that you are truly helping. Okay. So here, there are levels to the marginalization of families, at least by my definition. So first, there's these marginalized families who are working, who are able to pay their bills, but can't really get ahead. They can't, they rob Peter to pay Paul, um, but they do it, right? Um, and they could use a little extra hand up every now and then, right? And so they come and they get the resources and then they're able to be all right, right? Then there's the next level down where families are really struggling. Um, honestly, they just aren't making it. Um, and they are always like, these are the ones who know when the resources are available and they have these resources as a part of the budget. You know, like I know that it's energy assistance time. So doom, I'm gonna get this from, you know, like, and I was hurt. So I know this, I live this, right? 
But then there's yet another level of marginal, of marginalized families in our community. And those are the ones who are so overwhelmed and so stressed out that it's hour to hour. They can't even make a plan to do anything. If it happened, it happened. If it don't, it don't. And they are so traumatized by their poverty and their circumstances that they don't even really realize that they are in poverty or traumatized by it. It's just the way of life for them, right? And then still there's another one. And these are those elders in our community who have pre-existing health conditions or who have aches, real pain in their body and they can't do anything. And the struggle to, to get to somewhere or to access a resource is more traumatizing than just sitting there in silence and suffering. And I have the, the sheer pleasure of being able to support them in some ways that people think aren't meaningful, but for them, it means a lot. And for me, it means a lot to be able to give back. One, trust is huge. And they will sit on their stories and they won't share them. And they will go through in their homes quietly because they don't trust the formal systems that have plagued this society for decades and this community particularly for decades. So I've been able to establish relationships, one, because I have a former life. I ain't always been Christian like I am now. And I always tell my past, I'm still a little rough around the edges. So give me some grace. But um, I believe that God has called me out and that everybody don't have the ability to, um, to, to, to jail with me, right? So there's Christians and there are people who um, are able to work and everybody has their own specific, um, I guess I'll say their own assignment. And my assignment is to um, be a good, good steward over the resources that God gives me, right? Because I have discernment. And when people come at me with game, that's where I say I, I, I'm still a little rough around the edges, right? Because I'm going to call it out because I have to be a good steward over the little resources that I have, right? But I will help you, right? So I just say, please just come real, right? You come real, I you like... I've been there. I done done it. I don't think nobody ever gonna do it as better than, better than I did it, like or bad as I did it. You get to decide what that means, right? But um, I know that um, this is the call that God has on my life, and I've tried to leave found a life um, about hmm, twenty three, twenty four years ago. Because my son Julian is 25 now. And when I went there, he was a, he was just turning a year old. And um, my pastor said, well, um, if, if God is really calling you to leave, stay for six months. And if he's still telling you to leave, you go with my blessings. I'm still there. And here you are. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so Yeah. And that's wonderful, Jackie. Um, I know we are at eight o'clock, so we'll try to wrap up the event here pretty quick. But you you mentioned the virtual uh, dinner with Soul Santa, and I know you haven't asked with the essential care packages, right? Yeah. So would you be able to highlight really what you're most excited for and kind of your bold ask for the Christmas season? And then I want to make sure that uh, Rebecca, as the um, Nehemiah's director of mobilization, you can speak to some of the asks as well before we wrap up with a few educational opportunities. So I want to make sure that we can highlight uh, that. So would you want to so, outline that, Jackie? So the bold ask is, I believe we can give the 100 families that we have, we are going to give food baskets to. I'm talking about complete Christmas meals and other foods to help tie families over during the holiday while their kids are at home. But I need 100 essential kits of diapers and wipes, 100 essential toiletry kits that contain soap, lotion, toothpaste, deodorant, body wash, um, shampoo, conditioner, and things like that. Then I need 100 laundry kits, which will contain laundry soap, 
bleach, dryer sheets, and a roll of quarters. And then I need 100 essential household kits. Um, and these kits, they have the toilet paper, the paper towels, the cleaning products, the um, disinfectant wipes, the spray and all of that. And I believe we can get 100 of each of these kits to go along with each of those baskets. And in addition, we want a $25 gift card because I also am doing the dinner with Soul Center and some of my families are homeless. They're living in hotels. Um, they won't be able to cook a meal. So they won't get those baskets because it won't serve them no purpose. But I am asking for $25 cars to like McDonald's, um, you know, pizza restaurants and BW3s, whatever is close around the area where the hotels are, that families can um, at least treat their kids out to an evening. So um, the dinner with Soul Santa, we're going to prepare all the kits for the makings of the craft activities that we do. And we're going to have little elves around running around the city all evening, dropping them off. And then we're going to have a big zoom event where we'll be making our candy sleighs and our gingerbread houses and decorating. And the goal is to just have families sit down to do something fun together and not have to worry about a meal. Last year at our event, there were more moms and dads, engaged in decorating gingerbread houses than I ever saw before in my life. I couldn't believe it. And the kids were sitting at the table. They were all doing it together as a family. My heart was happy. So yeah, that's how. That's amazing, Jackie. I love your passion. I love when you talk about it. Just I can't stop but smile the whole time just because of how focus you are on everyone else um, and, and just how selfless you are with that. So I know Don dropped this in the chat a couple different times, but I also have it on the screen. So uh, again, it, there's a, three different ways that we can get um, financial, uh, your dollar to Jackie to make sure we can get those families, those gifts. Uh, again, those that really are at the bottom of that, the different tiers of marginalization that Jackie talked about. So that is something we are asking the audience. We know that, again, donating is a critical piece to being an ally, especially with, with the, the type of individuals and families that Jackie spoke about. So um, with that, Rebecca, I know, uh, is there anything addition that you wanted to add to that for some of the needs for this? And then we can actually talk about the couple upcoming educational opportunities as well. Sure. Um, I did drop a sign up sheet in the chat. So if you want to participate in the gingerbread houses or the candy sleighs or any of the donations for the gift cards and the essentials kit, um, there's a sign up sheet there. That way we can make sure all of the needs get met. Um, and you can see a visual representation of all of those needs and some directions as well. Um, I also want to ask all of you, Miss Jackie's been working all day on um, these shoe boxes that contain gifts for families. And um, she, her work isn't done. Like she stopped her work to be here with us tonight and there is still work to be done today. Um, so I wanted to ask if there were four or five people that might be willing to drop um, their names in the Q and A and go to Fountain of Life Church tonight and help her unload the U-Haul that she collected today with shoe boxes with gifts for children. Um, I also wanted to mention that part of this ministry is that she is asking for delivery drivers on Friday the 18th. There is a tab on that sheet. Um, there are three tabs total. There's a tab on that sheet just for delivery drivers, um, if that's something that might be of interest to you. Um, and then, yeah, we can get talking about the educational opportunities. Dan, did you want me to take that or were you interested in speaking to those things? If you could speak to those, that would be great. And then I, I'll uh, just kind of switch the slides as you're talking through. Awesome. Um, so we have a re-entry conference coming up about the COVID crisis that's happening in our jails right now. Um, obviously, the folks who are in our jails are not sentenced to, to death because we do not have that death penalty here in Wisconsin. Um, but with the rampant coronavirus within the jail system, um, we have a lot of people at risk of that being their, their fate. Um, so if you would like to learn more about that and more about um, what we might be able to do to interrupt that, um, tune in this Thursday from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. 
Um, the other thing that I would like to mention is that Black History for a New Day is ready to be signed up for. Um, we're starting Monday. <laughs> Tyler's very excited. Um, we're starting Monday, February 1st, and that's from 7 to 9 p.m. You can register, um, and we're going to do all of this virtually, which increases the capacity for this class, which is a wonderful thing for us. Um, a new option that we also have is that you can sign up as a group if you have 12 or more people, and we will train facilitators for your group specifically, and you can do this on your schedule as a group activity. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. And the only thing I wanted to comment about this course is I took it uh, almost two years ago. And I would say it's the most impactful course I've ever taken in my life. And I don't say that loosely or lightly. Um, and when you start thinking about um, the formal education, and yes, there's a cost to it, but the cost is so minimal compared to what you're going to learn. And I will tell you, you're going to learn history through a different lens, not through what you were ever taught in school, um, no matter what, you know, level of education you have. So I would just want to stress that it is a low level of, of investment for you and it's going to sell out fast. So it's one thing that I would recommend signing up soon um, because it, it is a really impactful course. Um, and so with that, Dr. G, do you have any closing remarks uh, that you want to give the audience? I just want to thank folks for sharing this evening with us. Um, it's, it's always impressive to me how people um, will take time to, to lean into allyship and, and, um, and listen and learn. That's important to me. And so I want you to lean into your tip. So not just lean and so that you come back to the same position, but lean until you tip over into something. And um, I just want to say that I appreciate the reach of this. I saw a friend's name in the chat room who I know from Seattle. So somehow the word's getting out to people inside our networks. But I would just say we're in a moment where people are looking for solutions and people are looking for healing and the kind of work that we're talking about, um, the community is prime for examples of this. So the best thing that we can do is to be those examples of people who care, who lean in, who help, who grow, who participate. And so let's, let's do that. Let's not just internalize this information and intellectualize it. Let's take some very meaningful steps. Show up and help Jackie unload a truck click the link, support, educate yourselves, get involved. But this is a moment to be on the right side of history and to help to turn history. We've never needed you and our non-Black allies to be on board um, more than we do right now. And if we do nothing, we are worse than the people who we call the bad guys. So please take advantage of this opportunities so that we can leave a better um, future for our children. They deserve much better than this and we get to be part of setting that up. And once again, Dr. G, uh, you set me up for the last slide that, um, so at the end of the last event, right, what we're always focused on is exactly what Dr. G just said, which is take action, right? Allyship is a verb. It's, it's really about the journey. Um, and it's not about having a title. And what we did at the, at the end of the last event is we asked what action uh, did people take? And so I wanted to call out for those who are new, uh, Dr. G talks about allies who donate, educate and affiliate. And so that's why you're seeing this on the slide the way it is. I know the text is small, but what I wanted to call out is don't, you can get creative with how you donate. Um, some people did a college gift through Nehemiah, others donated to the center that Dr. G talked about in our last event. They joined the sustained solidarity team. But what I wanna call out is um, they are donating with unrestricted funds, which means they are trusting the organization to most efficiently and effectively use that money. And that is critical because that is not typically how funds uh, or funders um, provide those donations to black led organizations. And then what I wanted to call out again on the education piece is the top section is how people are listening to podcasts, going to presentations, reading books, attending a book club that Nehemiah just had, which was awesome. But then they're also switching that to educating others. So they're going through a witnessing whiteness class, but then they're leading or they're facilitating. And so think, I want to challenge you to think not just about educating yourself, but how can you use your platform to educate others in this space as well? And then lastly, with affiliate, what we just talked about with, with Jackie and, and um, unloading the truck or being a, a driver, others have volunteered to paint at Nehemiah's homes. It's things that you may not think of that um, Rebecca will continue to highlight in these series and provide um, examples of where you can and apply different trades and skills. Um, others organized a donation drive for Miss Jackie, and the list goes on. But what I wanted to say is this just came out of uh, a few, a handful of people at the last event. And so these are just tactical or tangible examples of what you can do. 
And so I wanted, again, we'll be sending this out afterwards, um, but wanted to, again, ask you to commit to taking one action leaving this event. We'll leave that to you to what that is. Um, but with that, I want to wrap up the event. And there's a lot of thank yous that I want to uh, very quickly give um, because this event takes a lot of people to, to pull it off. And so thank you, Dr. G, again, for your vision and leadership and, and really um, in the racial justice space within Nehemiah, Justified Anger, uh, Fountain of Life, but also coming tonight. And again, I know you have other work to be doing, but coming and giving your time. So thank you for that. Um, wanted to thank Tyler and Stephanie again for your insights on how we're going to have productive conversations, not just this holiday season, but moving forward. And thank you, Jackie, as well, for sharing about your experiences about Foster and what you're trying to do this holiday season. We, we're absolutely, uh, we love what you're trying to do there. Um, but thank you to the generator again for the technology, the back end support. Thank you, Don, for dropping all of that information in the chat so quickly. And Samantha, uh, Rebecca, Eli, and Don for, for planning this event as well. So again, the, there will be a follow-up email that comes from Justified Anger. So watch for that. And then we'll be also promoting future events uh, coming up in the, in the next few weeks as well. So, so with that, thank you for your time tonight and uh, have a good night. <laughs>